Welcome back to RFL. You know, conventions like the kind that begin today in Charlotte, they normally give candidates at least a small boost in the polls. But for Mitt Romney, that, that was true, but only for a couple of days. The excitement of the RNC put Romney out ahead of Obama last Thursday and Friday, but by Saturday, his small lead in the polls had evaporated. In fact, Romney has become the first candidate to experience a negative convention bounce since Gallup has been tracking convention bounces. And you got to go all the way back to Lyndon Johnson in 1964 for that to happen. Now, today, as the Democratic convention kicks into full gear, Obama is still in the lead, but only slightly. And there you see the latest poll numbers. The uh, stakes for the president very high this week. Romney's challenge last week was to humanize himself and reintroduce himself to the American people. Now, considering that the president still holds a pretty significant lead in the favorability category. And you look at that spread in terms of who voters like the most. Well, that may not be President Obama's biggest challenge this week. Now, this number is his challenge. 76% of Americans say they believe the country is headed on the wrong track. The question is, who do they blame for that uh, trend? Do they blame President Obama or do they blame Republicans in Congress. Want to give you an idea of what we're going to have on the program tonight. A lot of different themes for this uh, first day of the Democratic Convention. We're also going to be joined by a terrific panel as we focus on what the Democrats should focus on for the rest of their convention. Our panelists tonight include Richard Brodsky. He, of course, a former New York State Assemblyman, Democratic, uh, senior fellows at Demos, and a uh, professor at NYU. It's Demos, isn't it? Didn't it I, is. I stepped on that. My apologies. Dominic Carter didn't step on that. Political journalist and author, and Rob Taub. Fox News contributor and political commentator and humorist. And, and first of all, what did you guys make of the fact that there's been no bounce for Romney coming out of the Republican convention? Is it Romney? Is it the convention? Or are we just at an era where there's no more bounces? I don't think they wanted a bounce. I think they made a decision to sort of abandon the 12 undecided voters in the United States and to focus <laughs> on turning out the base. And that means that they are, that's the explanation for Paul Ryan, who's you know, sort of a, a shiny modern version of Mitt Romney. And uh, I, I don't think they were looking for one. I don't think they got one. The interesting thing will be whether Obama can get one with those 12 undecided voters. What do you think? Does Obama need a bounce? And do you think that's what they're playing for tonight? And, and as the week goes on. Well, if you're the incumbent president and the economy is doing the way that it is, of course you want to bounce. Considering uh, who Mr. Obama was in terms of four years ago, being able to energize the base and the country, Andrew, and the way that he did, of course the Democrats are looking for a bounce. But at the end of the day, I, I don't know if the bounces really matter because at the end of the day, we're just going to look back uh, look back on this. The bottom line is what happens on election day. You know, Rob, I thought the I thought Mitt Romney needed to get more out of the Republican convention than President Obama necessarily needs to get out of the Democratic convention. People know President Obama; they they have a sense of who he is, whether they like him or don't like him. Uh, and didn't have it with Mitt Romney. Do you, do you concur? Do you think it was the conventions were bigger for Mitt Romney than for? I, I do think that the problem Romney's facing is you have people that are considering or have abandoned President Obama, but nobody is saying, I'm going to champion Mitt Romney. I'm an independent or I'm a disgruntled Democrat like, like myself. And so that's an issue for him. I think he tried to humanize himself when he told the story about how he once had to fly commercial and how traumatic it was for him. <laughs> it was a frightening experience, and everybody really related to that. All right, so uh, what, do you, what would you like to hear out of the convention this week, and, and what do you think we're going to hear out of the convention this I week? I think you're going to see images. Most, so more than what you hear, it's what you see. First thing, you'll, it won't be that sort of monochrome of the Republican convention. You're going to see people who look different than you look and, in the end, think differently. The, 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 you, you said something earlier that I think is not what people are, are, are concerned about. Not, it's not who they blame. They sort of blame everybody. What Obama has to do in this convention is explain to them why what he will do is different and, and more likely to succeed than what Romney will do. But isn't that what we heard in the 2010 midterms where it was the bus stuck in the ditch and they want to, you know, and we're trying to pull it out of the ditch and they're like, no, give us the keys to the car. I mean, it seems like that argument didn't play in the midterms. I, and, and it seems like you're, you're saying that should be I, the... I, I think for, again, those 12 undecided voters, especially in the swing states, that's what they're looking for. The, the, this is not an appeal to the electorate broadly defined. This is an appeal to very narrow segments of the electorate. Motivate the ones who are with you. 
persuade the ones who aren't, and make the other guy look bad. I think the message for the Democrats out of this week is going to be one of the road has been bumpy for the country. Every American knows that. Every American is living that. Every American feels that. But the message is going to be we're on the path to recovery and you need to stick with us for another four years to continue this. That was the point of that Bill Clinton commercial. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're going to hear over and over. I did think the Republicans did offer us a little bit of some different faces in terms of the female Republican governors. So, I mean, they, they tried. They, they tried a little bit. I'm not talking about the speakers. I'm talking about the audience. Okay. The people in the convention hall. Okay. That the was, audience we, is we, we agree. 15,000 journalists. <laughs> it, it felt a lot like that at the yes. Republican convention, too. Is Do the Republican, or, I'm sorry, do the Democrats and the president have to lay out their vision for the next four years? Or can this just be about, you know, we're the party that's trying to get the bus back on the track or the, the train back on the track, and, and uh, it's, it's those Republicans oh, they'll to blame. They'll, they'll, they'll do that. They'll draw. The, that's the easy part. The, 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 again, if you're targeting to narrow slices rather than making a broad a sort of Reagan-esque or Roosevelt-esque appeal, I, I think you're going to see this very carefully done. I think it's going to be better run without the mistakes that the Republican convention showed. Well, I, I think I, I kept count. I think I heard George Bush's name mentioned four or five times the entire week in Tampa. There may be an over-under on that number just tonight at the Democratic number. Oh, certainly. You think we'll yes. hear George certainly Bush a lot? Certainly you'll hear George Bush's name a lot more tonight. The Democrats are going to... Uh, focus on that, and rightfully so. I mean, you can't just rewrite history and act like it didn't happen. I'll, I'll bet you a buck that what one of the things Michelle talks about tonight Deal. is <laughs> <laughs> doesn't matter what the subject is <laughs> is uh, Afghanistan. Uh, I think in some bizarre way, the most emblematic moment of the of the Romney speech was his failure to mention it. I think they're going to pick up on that. All right, let's, uh, the, rather than speculate about what we're going to get inside the convention tonight, let's turn to our own Richard French, who joins us live from Charlotte with a preview of what we can expect uh, coming from the convention tonight. Good evening, Rich. How you doing, Andrew? And uh, right behind me, uh, Cory Booker just finished addressing uh, the crowd. You see the mayor of Los Angeles there as well. Uh, the convention uh, beginning in earnest this evening. You know, I heard... Um, Dominic saying you're going to hear a lot of George Bush. I saw Richard here. Uh, you might hear Afghanistan. I think tonight, uh, certainly the two most notable speakers are going to be one, the First Lady, obviously, but also we'll be hearing from the mayor of San Antonio. And this is constituency-driven uh, conventions. We saw it certainly in Tampa, and uh, you're going to hear it tonight. They're going to try and certainly court the, the women's vote. They're going to talk about issues, reproductive rights. First Lady is going to humanize the president. We know from some advanced excerpts he's not going to go after Romney or even some of the things we heard from Tampa. And we also know that the mayor of San Antonio, um, he's going to really be talking about the American dream. He and his brothers um, basically route to the United States, one now mayor of San Antonio, the other in all likelihood will be the congressman representing that district. And obviously they're going to be talking about the American dream in a Latino context, which is obviously a major demographic for the president to get to today. Now, earlier today, Andrew, I sat down with Jake Tapper, who's the senior White House correspondent for ABC News, and we really talked about Tampa and also Charlotte in different contexts, both what the stakes are for the president tonight and also what we expect we're going to hear for the next three days here as the president certainly is going to try and do better than the Republicans did in Tampa and have a major uptick here when they leave here and go on the campaign trail in earnest. You saw the numbers out today and the GOP really didn't get much of a bump if at all out of Tampa. What are the expectations two, three points? What are they trying to get out of these next three days? I wouldn't be surprised if there was no bump uh, for the president, just like there wasn't really much of one for Mitt Romney. This race is very tight. It's pretty much a deadlock, 45-45. Somewhere in there, it goes up a point or two here and there. But, uh, I mean, what's been amazing about this race is how consistent it's been. We in Washington will be covering, you know, all the minutia and the back and forth, and then the polls come out the next week and nothing has changed. It's as if, you know, the previous week didn't happen. So I would not be surprised if that happened after this convention, too. 
there's so many different ways they could play this. Um, identity politics, if you just dispassionately look at it, they're going to have, somebody's going to reach out to the Latino vote, to the female vote tonight. Obviously, Clinton will try and bring back, one would think, middle class white voters. Is, is that the play, or is it more he's going to try and revisit four years ago when it was a whole big tent kind of big idea? Well, remember, in this era, uh, the speakers are speaking less to the 15,000 people here at the Time Warner Cable Center or the, even the 75,000 at the uh, Bank of America Stadium as they are to the people at home, especially the one or two million Americans who are going to decide this election, uh, one or two million people who voted for Obama last time who are on the fence this time. And that's who you're going to see, I think, a lot of this targeted at. Uh, you're not going to hear, I don't think you'd hear, uh, just as you didn't at the Republican convention, a lot of talk about social issues that might divide people or might cause people to turn away from voting for Obama or Romney last week. You're going to hear a case to be made for Obama, a case to be made against Romney, and it will probably focus on, on economic policy. There's a tinge of frustration, not just by him, but his handlers, that what happened for those three days in Tampa, facts got thrown out the window. And while everybody's going to make their case, they just disregard what he believed were the facts on the ground. He also thinks that you know, he should revisit what's gone on for the past four years and from the perception of those that you cover on a daily basis, the toxic, dysfunctional atmosphere that made it next to impossible to get anything through. Can he do that without coming across as whiny or negative? Uh, it's a, it's a tightrope because, uh, first of all, Republicans are not the only ones that have made factually yep. questionable assertions this election. We've heard President Obama and Vice President Biden in the last week say things that weren't true. Biden talked about a, uh, what he said was a bailout of Bain Capital by taxpayers. It actually was a $10 million bailout by the FDIC, which is not taxpayer money. Uh, and then President Obama said that uh, Mitt Romney didn't support the timetable to withdraw from Afghanistan, which is not true. He has uh, said that he supports that timetable once NATO got on board. Um, it's, you know, it's an argument to make. I think that if you're going to be uh, accusing people of, of spinning and lying during a campaign, you better be purer than Caesar's wife. And uh, I'm not yet convinced, uh, even if one side is fibbing more than the other, that, that you know, both sides aren't doing it. Last thing we heard, this will be different. In, in Charlotte, we're going to get an actual remedy. I think the president said there was no secret sauce, no um, layout for what if the Republicans would they would do. Do you think we'll get some substance, some facts out of these next three days? Uh, well, I think that w that's one of the big challenges for President Obama Thursday night is to, ha you know, the, the campaign has spent um, six months to a year trying to make Romney an unacceptable alternative. Now the president has to really give people a clear vision of why they should vote for him, not just against Romney, but what the next four years would look like, uh, what the roadmap is, what the plan is, why the next four years would be better than the previous four years. Um, I think that's a tall order, but that's that's what he needs to do on Thursday night. And last thing I'll let you go, I, saw, I know you saw the post story today about the backstory of Clinton and Obama and the dynamic unvetted speech here. He's going against the Cowboys and the Giants. Somebody right. will tell me why they did that one. But anyway, that's going to be a fascinating byplay, don't you think, how they got to this point and what happens tomorrow? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's look, it's been interesting. Uh, the Obama-Bill Clinton relationship, the Obama-Hillary Clinton relationship has been fascinating to cover, fascinating to watch. Uh, I think it's probably um, overhyped a little bit by us in the media, but also, you know, Bill Clinton, uh, it's in his interest to give a great speech that makes a good case for uh, President Obama. So at the end of the day, however much drama there is behind the scenes and however much we read about Clinton aides or Obama aides saying this or that, I, I, I don't doubt that he'll give a speech like the one he gave in 2008 when he supported President Obama as well. And again, that my conversation earlier today with Jake Tapper. I tell you one other thing that's pretty clear that you get from this, which is the campaign is not only acknowledging, but they're embracing and going after the question about whether America is better off uh, now than they were four years ago. Now, polls show two-thirds of the public think they're doing the same or worse, but yet the administration is going to say over the next three days we'll give compelling reasons why the country is better economically and because of health care and a lot of other changes that have taken place over the president's first term. Andrew?
Rich, look ahead towards tonight for me. Julian Castro, the mayor of San Antonio, is speaking. It's a spotlight role, as you know. You think we're going to get a, a, a similar to Obama speech in 2004, not a blue America or a red America, but one America? Or is it going to be a real narrow appeal towards Hispanic voters and towards key, uh, key groups? You know, it's a little inside baseball, Andrew, I think, for audience, but the mayor in San Antonio, he's got to work across uh, party lines, and by all accounts here, uh, he does. However, we also know that he's going to hit on the hard thing that one party is all about closing off doors for people to achieve the American dream, and the president, and the president will apparently hit in a second term on immigration reform, the president with the DREAM Act and other things is about trying to give a leg up to those those who want to do the right thing, play by the rules, keep their nose clean here, and be everything that embodies what the American dream is about. So to answer your question, I think it's going to be a little bit of both. Uh, he'll wrap his arms around the flag, but on the same end, he'll say one party here is for uh, Latinos. That's the Democratic Party, and we both know that's the fastest growing demographic in America. All right, RNN's Richard French live in Charlotte tonight. Rich, hang tight. We'll get back to you a little bit later on in the broadcast. And uh, we're going to take a quick break here on RFL. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the tone of the conventions. Some say the GOP's fixation on welfare is a, a not-so-secretive way of injecting race into the debate. Do you agree? And what tone do you think will underlie the Democratic convention? That is next. Stay with us.